This is going to be a little bit different than what we've heard. Uh, this is current research. I um, just submitted the manuscript of a journal article to uh, the Journal of Media, Culture, and Society. So I'm curious to hear your comments and questions. Um, so I'm going to be working in a new area, kind of focused on media studies, critical data studies, thinking about uh, online communities and things like that. And uh, the title of my presentation today is Information Literacy in the Age of Internet Conspiracy. Uh, oh, something happened. Okay. So uh, we're all familiar with conspiratorial thinking and conspiracies. They've been a kind of recurrent feature of American life for a long time. Uh, these include things such as the moon landing being faked, um, the CIA killing John F. Kennedy, or 9-11 uh, being an inside job. Um, whatever the conspiracy is, there's usually um, a community that sort of adheres to it, and there's a ton of great ones out there um, to explore. Uh, traditional conceptions of conspiracy theorists or people who advocate conspiracy theories um, have, uh, have appeared um, throughout our culture, um, and there's a general sense that these are typically imagined as loners, um, sort of lone wolf uh, conspiracy theorists. They're socially maladjusted. They don't fit in well with others. Um, mentally ill or delusional, um, seeing things that aren't there and putting patterns into place that don't exist necessarily. Um, they're unreasonably paranoid, kind of related to the delusion, um, and they're hostile toward authority figures, usually uh, the state with a capital S, but it could be other authority figures as well. Uh, and finally, potentially violent, um, although this is debatable. And I should also add that conspiracy theorists are usually depicted almost in most, if not every case, as white, uh, white men. Finally, for my research, the most interesting piece is that uh, they're often depicted as being information illiterate or unable to see facts. Um, in my research project, what I'm looking at is what I call the information dark age, and I describe it as a very different set of features than the traditional conceptions of conspiracy theorists. Um, the information dark age is predicated on certain uh, concepts. One of these is platform capitalism, or the notion now that information is uh, readily available and is marketable. Access it via different platforms. The second is anonymity. So the fact that we can now um, engage one another online with complete anonymity is a real key feature of what I'm calling the information dark uh, The rise of the dark web. If you haven't heard of the dark web, we can talk about that later, but essentially the dark web is a sort of layer of the internet below the mainstream web. And actually to do a lot of the research for this project, I was uh, I had to go into the dark web and actually look at content. And essentially the, one of the features of the dark web is that it's untraceable. And so um, people that are anonymous and you can't. Um, two major strands of philosophy that have popped up online a lot recently are key features of the information dark age as well. So one of these is the anti-enlightenment philosophies of Nick Land. Um, and then the second is a group of thinkers that call themselves the intellectual dark web. Um, generally, they're kind of both seen as neo-reactionary um, uh, anti-enlightenment thinkers um, who operate sort of outside of uh, accepted politically correct mainstream uh, sort of philosophy. Uh, and also, uh, the rise of social media platforms and the ubiquity of web access for much of the world. Uh, and then finally, for me, the notion of information hyperliteracy is a real key feature of this. So unlike the conspiracy theorist who is imagined uh, to be factually ignorant, the information dark age is actually hyperliterate in that we have ac access to so much information um, that connections can be built between uh, for my research project, I focused exclusively on the um, very complex and interesting online conspiracy known as QAnon. Uh, QAnon really began in October of 2017 when a mysterious anonymous uh, poster on 4chan began posting uh, what he called breadcrumbs. And these breadcrumbs were alleged in intelligence leaks from within the White House detailing a conspiracy a uh, global conspiracy um, sort of uh, that would soon be exposed is kind of the central ethos of QAnon. 
And it's been picked up by some celebrities such as Roseanne. Um, it's been picked up by politicians. There have been several uh, Congress people who have run for office under a QAnon um, platform. And then of course, um, there's been sort of a growing conspiracy group online that have been um, advocating for this uh, theory. QAnon um, community is an essential part of this. Um, and it's a really weird paradox that while everybody posting on 4chan or now 8chan are anonymous, um, in fact, they do form a kind of coherent community that works uh, in collaboration. Um, and inside this community, there is a sense of solidarity. Um, the community is made up of Anons and Bakers, and Bakers basically refers to the breadcrumbs. They put the information that Q drops into a coherent narrative. And you can see here, they imagine themselves as researchers who deal in open source information, reasoned argument, and of course, dank memes. Um, so Anons and Bakers are the sort of uh, foot soldiers of the QAnon community. Uh, research is a central organizing principle, um, and there are tons of uh, pages online about how to do research uh, in order to build the QAnon narrative. Uh, there's a pedagogical front to this as well called red pilling, which is a reference to the matrix. Uh, and red pilling is essentially exposing friends and family to the QAnon conspiracy and educating them about this underlying global conspiracy um, and exposing them to, to it through information access and information literacy. Uh, it's militantly anti-establishment um, and it's dedicated to President Trump, but it's important to note, remains neither Republican nor Democrat in political orientation. So this is a group that um, sort of disdains political parties, but does have certain uh, affiliations. Um, and those are shifting and changing all the time as well. Um, and so more recent posts have sort of shifted away from some of their early. Uh, central to the QAnon conspiracy is what's called, what I call the master narrative. So unlike the postmodern belief that master narratives are inadequate, uh, QAnon believers have actually worked to recreate a master narrative that uh, underlies the conspiracy. Um, central to this master narrative is weaving in social media users to help build the theory. Um, a belief in teleology and eschatology. So uh, the notion here is that eventually the conspiracy will be exposed at some end point in history. And that when that happens, it's a kind of end times or eschatology that they call the great awakening, um, when the world will realize uh, that this global conspiracy has been operating. Um, they practice information literacy as an online ethos. They take it very seriously. And so if you wanna join the QAnon online community, you have to go through a certain amount of training in research and information access before they'll accept you. Um, and all of this leads to baking the bread, as they call it, or putting together the narrative of the conspiracy um, in order to control it. Um, and recently, this has taken on a different shift called information warfare. So recently, a lot of the, the uh, common threads on 8chan have started turning to what they call information warfare. Information warfare is a new front whereby QAnons use information resources, compile those resources, and then leverage them into social media conflicts of various sorts. This one here that I'm showing you is from um, an operation called Voter ID Meme Warfare, in which you can see that there's actually a series of targets for social media sort of group attacks, and they include things like how to tweet directly at um, congressmen and senators, um, how to use certain memes and how to access images and content for the for the operation. If you look down at the bottom here, um, where it says information warfare, this is some of the common common rhetoric for QAnon uh, information warfare. So fire at will and keep firing the meme cannons till we till someone does something. Um, and I love the idea of the meme cannon, but I think it's a mistake to sort of just laugh these things off as um, silly because they are taken very seriously. Um, future challenges for this project and future research. So um, the future challenges are that it's difficult to combat anonymous posting. 
And it's almost impossible to separate the trolls on 8chan from the true Q believers. There are also in this institutional limitations as people from academia are generally um, held in disdain. And it's hard to stop the spread or false information or contain it to the dark web. And so there have been several instances where people believing in the QAnon conspiracy actually um, plan to commit some kind of violent act, um, although there are fewer than you might imagine. Um, future research for this is going to be looking at things like how do deplatforming and censorship uh, actually sort of exacerbate the problem rather than solve it. Um, doing some text analysis of Q posts, you can see I've actually started some of that work now. Um, measuring all of the 4,000 or 5,000 Q information drops, uh, and then thinking about the role of information literacy and pedagogy in how we deal with internet conspiracy. Thank you.